to the Orange County Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Alma Harris. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Allen. It's an honor to be with you and your staff this morning. And, you know, listening to the two of you, um, Superintendent Martin and uh, Armstrong, there's room in Orange County for you both. <laughs> You're not too far from us, as a matter of fact. But let me just zero in from the county perspective and make uh, some statements that I hope will add to the conversation. First of all, as you all know, the LCAP is the linchpin for the local control funding formula and school effectiveness. It provides the analytics to determine um, adherence to timelines, uh, state education priorities, and the engagement of all parties. Most importantly, I think that it will lead to the fidelity of the metrics and the interventions that uh, we choose to measure student achievement. Um, this is an arduous task that requires time, skill, experience, and wisdom. There, there's no shortcuts here. Um, you know, we all want to have the, the 10 steps to take to uh, prosperity, but it isn't going to happen. It requires gutting it out and going through something that's going to take some, some time, some resources as well. Um, you, you need to have the right resources to get this done. In Orange County, the Orange County Department of Education, we serve over 500,000 students. There are 27 districts and 600 schools. Two-thirds of the pupils in our schools are students of color, uh, most of whom are Latino. 50% are at the poverty level, and 25% of them are English learners, so that kind of mirrors the state. Uh, those students that I mentioned to you in terms of EL and poverty, um, and of course our foster kids come into this uh, category large, often, not always, but often, they're the type that are rutted in the uh, deciles one to three of the former API. Um, we're heartened with the local control funding formula. I think it is what is right for California in terms of assuring college readiness and success. As a matter of fact, I tell our folks, you know, there's 58 counties in the state. There's about 3,000 across the country. Orange County wants to lead the nation in college and career readiness and success. And we think we have the metrics and we think we have the will, the political will to do this. So that's our goal. That's our vision. It's a big one, but that's where a vision needs to be. Um, we formulated a brand new strategic plan. Somebody mentioned, I think it was the uh, LAO, one of the weaknesses of school districts, and that is the ability to think strategically, like from a business point of view. I, I don't believe that that's true, but I suppose it can it apply somewhere. But uh, we started a brand new strategic plan to align to the, not only the eight educational priorities, but the two that the county offices have. So that's 10. Um, and um, we started with all of, our, all of our districts. We began the process of collaboration by having face-to-face -face meetings with all superintendents. We had a 100%, all of them were involved. We <laughs> formed leadership teams between the county and our uh, school districts. And this enabled us to talk seriously about this, to understand the antecedents of the local control funding formula, you know, going from weighted student formula to LCFF, and what did the governor have in mind, and, you know, how can we now use this to, uh, to really affect change in the classroom, the core of the instructional program right in the classroom, and assure that our students are achieving at grade level. We carefully followed the template and uh, we started off by first getting our, our districts to produce a draft of, of an LCAP. So that enabled us to get in front of it. And, and we did it in a way that I believe was winsome and encouraging and engaging. It wasn't a top-down model. And what I like about um, the LCAP for county offices is that this is really, I think, reshaping the understanding of a county office. You know, you know that we had the fiduciary uh, responsibility to assure fiscal solvency. And, and, and now I believe with the LCAP, we're, we're right in that same role with respect to assuring that students are making the mark on grade level and moving ahead. I think that um, with the rubrics, the evaluation rubrics that uh, we're waiting to see, we have an understanding of what that's gonna look like, that will be able to truly measure the efficacy of our interventions. Um, you know, I, I do want to give a shout out to CSESA. Uh, you know, Peter Birdsall was up here earlier because I really believe that CISC, which is the curriculum and, and intervention or instructional side, it's a committee 
under uh, CSESA, and BASC, which is the Business and Administration Com uh, Steering Committee, produced manuals and training documents that have been used statewide. Um, we also, of course, had assistance by FICMAT. FICMAT provided sort of a coherence of understanding and thinking. So these external agencies have come together to help our state. Naturally, the State Board of Education and the Department of Finance also weighed in. And we're grateful to WestEd for the work that WestEd has done. Um, I do believe, as was said here, that it is a question of equity. It's a question of advocacy. Um, it's a question of are we going to lead the nation? California is the strongest economy, the most populous economy. Be before I took this job, I served as the president for the college, the vice president for the college board, and I had all of the West. Before that, I was in Santa Ana for almost 12 years as a superintendent. And I can tell you that, that there are more students sitting for advanced placement courses, courses of rigor. You want to talk about a gap? We have a rigor gap in this country, too, and particularly in California. But more students uh, involved in advanced placement courses uh, than anywhere in the, in, the, in the country. Nothing looks like California. California, as you all know, is the big dog. So I hope that this will become the mechanism to assure school success, to ascend the state in terms of our education, our public education system to the top tier, and, uh, and we'll make our mark globally. Thank you, Superintendent Maharis. Um, now we'll move to Oscar Cruz, the President and CEO of Families and Schools. Good morning. Thank you uh, so much for the invitation of being able to share some of the comments regarding parent engagement. Um, my, my name is Oscar Cruz. I'm the president of Families and Schools. We're a nonprofit, 15 years in the making, that has been focused on the area of parent engagement. And uh, just a note, when I mention parents, I'm talking about guardians. I'm talking about all those family members that are, you know, uh, supporting student achievement at home. Uh, but, you know, parent engagement is nothing new. There's not like I have to convince you with data to show you that when parents are engaged, uh, you know, student uh, achievement increases. I think the question from a policy perspective that we're talking about here today is more about what is the role of the districts and schools to be able to reach out to parents to make it as easy as possible for parents to be engaged. Uh, eliminating the obstacles that parents face. So um, well, I'm going to have my comments just briefly about some of the trends that we saw during the first year and also share a couple of recommendations that we think would be useful as we moving forward, not only with LCF, uh, LCFF, but with the LCAP. Um, and let me start just by uh, very briefly uh, putting some context into uh, this term of parent engagement because it's one of those terms that can mean everything, but at the same time it can mean nothing because it is so broad. Um, the parent engagement in LCS, uh, LCFF has two core components or two ways in which it's being framed. One is the stakeholder engagement, which you've been hearing, which is give us input. You know, let me, let me hear what, what community uh, wants to say. Uh, that to us is something that, you know, it, it's good, but it's something that we've had in many other programs. When uh, districts get money from the federal government through Title I, there's requirements and compliance on being able to uh, provide me, uh, have meetings with parents. The second piece, which was very, very interesting for us, was that in the LCAP, the question was not only what did you hear from parents, but now what did you incorporate in your plan that was going to make it uh, even uh, easier for parents to engage on a day-to-day -day level? So there's two areas. There's the <coughs> input piece. Uh, and there's the culture piece of the school. And I think that that's very important for us to keep uh, separate because at the moment that we model those two, we're not having very clear indicators of what we're trying to measure with parent and community engagement. Um, the work that we did uh, last year, we arranged from uh, having meetings with the parents to kind of hear what they wanted to say about LCFF. Uh, we partnered with school districts to provide training to the parents who were part of the, uh, of the uh, PAC or the parent engagement committees. Uh, but we most recently did an assessment of 14 different school districts where we had an interview with both a superintendent in each of those school districts, a school board member, and the person leading parental engagement in those districts, in those 14 school districts across um, the state. Uh, and I think there was three uh, big trends that came out of, out of that assessment. We were wanting to see what was happening on the ground. One, and, and I will echo what a lot of what you said, there was a lot of energy. The amount of energy about trying to figure out how to go out and reach out to parents was very impressive. Uh, we had surveys. Uh, districts were exploring how do you go into churches to have community uh, conversations. Uh, there was a lot of proactive action. Uh, well, let's not just hear from parents. Let's hear from the students themselves. 
Uh, but one of the things we noticed around that trend was, again, was that it was very uneven. There was no sense of benchmarking on whether should we also have students be part of the uh, committees, right? Uh, it was, you know, one district wanted to do it this way, the another district did not. Uh, so well, there's a la uh, la uh, lack of consistency. Um, and the other part was that, you know, there was a lack of training uh, that was happening. You know, we know that it was not as simple as bringing 100 parents to a room and saying, what do you guys want, right? The issues that we're talking about are so complex and complicated. They can't be done in one meeting. It can't be done just by asking someone, tell me what you want in the budget. So this is a longer process that goes on, and we saw that there was not enough attention paid on the training component to be able to uh, uh, produce quality recommendations from those committees that were being uh, discussed. Uh, the second piece was uh, this, uh, once you look not on the, in, on the stakeholder engagement piece, but what are districts actually doing to improve the culture of the schools? Uh, there was a lot of vagueness. Uh, there was a lot of very general outcomes that were put under parent and community engagement. Um, which was something that actually came out on the uh, LAO's report, which was that it was very hard to, to really point your finger and say, how is this what you're doing in, uh, in Section 8 is really linked to student achievement. Um, and I'm, I think that that's part, not only, not because it's a process of not being able, able to write the LCAP, but it's because school districts were really trying to explore what else is there beyond bringing parents to a meeting about parental engagement. Um, and, and I think that uh, when we did see a lot of uh, very specific examples, we saw, for example, parent center li liaisons or coordinators being hired as a way to say, oh, we're addressing parent and community engagement. But even then, they needed a lot more detail of saying, how is that hired being linked to the student achievement goals that you want at your school? Um, so that there was some vagueness there. Uh, the third piece, and I think this is the most important piece, is that um, it began to trigger conversation of parent engagement, not what I, we call uh, meetings and flyers, but changing the school culture uh, at the school. Because what the parent, at the end of the day, they want is to feel that they'll come in into a school and they feel respected, that they feel valued, they feel welcome, and that their voice hurts. But that type of culture requires different type of technical support. Um, that is not support that districts need on writing a plan. You know, that may be the fact that some districts need support to be able to write a plan. There's technical support on actually how to work with parents when in many cases in the districts we're working that the, the difference between the administrators or maybe the staff to the communities that they're serving sometimes could be very, very big. Uh, in a community where maybe the, there may be only one or maybe no a person that speaks the language or the families that they're trying to, to support. So I, I really think that there is this component of what we internally in families and schools call uh, parent engagement 2.0, is the next generation. We're talking about culture, school climate. It's about con uh, being able to transform that, uh, that school into a support school for the families that we work with. Um, and, and so I would say that uh, there is opportunities here uh, as well in some of the work that districts are doing with partnership with nonprofits. When we start talking about school discipline, parent engagement, there are many nonprofits out there who have been working on these topics for many years. And uh, the counties could be an option for techno support, but districts could be looking at their local nonprofits to generate some kind of level of partnership to address those areas. This is, an, I don't think that we saw as much as we wanted to see on those partnerships with districts and, uh, and nonprofits. Um, let me uh, let me then say let me let me move on to the area of recommendations on the uh, on the issue of the LCAPs. Um, the access to concise data to parents and um, and training, like we said, to when you were convening parents to talk to them. There's going to be uh, in in year two, year three, and year four uh, a lot of information that needs to be provided to parents on what happened from year one for there to be informed discussions to say, well, where do we go from here now? So there's an access of data, and I really think that this is an access, uh, access to information transparency around student data, about financial data. Where did the money go? What happened to the money that we were talking about last year? Uh, and there has to be greater pressure to be able to assure that that, that information is being provided to parents. Um, the, the second is the expectations, and there was a recommendation from the uh, legislative analyst office that talked about maybe not allowing or not asking the districts to report on aid, on all eight state um, uh, priorities. 
I, I think that that would be an error if we were to move where districts could choose where they would want to, um, you know, what they want to focus on. Uh, I believe that the eight pri priorities as really approved by the legislature was the way of saying that they were standardizing quality across the state. So that if a student walked in into a school in Sacramento or they walked into Riverside or, or the West Side or San Diego, that there were some common uh, er things that were non-negotiable. This school should provide this level of support to families. So I think that by allowing maybe districts to just say this may be the area that I need to focus on will defeat the purpose of standardizing quality education. Um, we know there's quality education throughout the state. I mean, it's not an issue that we think that we don't have quality. The problem is, is that quality accessible to every single child in this community? So standardizing quality is that area where I think the eight priorities have to be an area where we need to all look at this eight things that as a state we said was critical. Um, and then the next moving forward, I think that the other uh, learning is the clear uh, benchmarks and indicators. Um, it's gonna be very important to have concise information to be able to report back on whether a school is, is, is improving or not. Um, you know, we, we all believe that moving away from just one single number from an API is, is needed. We have multiple uh, levels to measure success. But at the end of the day, if I cannot explain to a parent whether this school falls where it falls between being a good school or a bad school, and I have to give them 15, 50 indicators to tell me, you know, this is what we have, we have failed to create that transparency where parents they are able to determine where they want their kids or how they be able to work with their schools. Um, and finally, I think I would want to just mention about accountability. Um, and, and, and the importance of accountability with, 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 uh, with LCFF, there's, uh, I would say there's three questions that parents are asking uh, that, ha that are those kind of questions that happen before school, after school, uh, the, at home. They're, these are not the formal questions you'll hear, but they'll say, so what happened to all those meetings that happened last year? What was the outcome of those meetings? Where did the money go that we were talking about? They were talking about, you know, they brought us into this meeting to tell us there was more money to be able to help our kids, that uh, African-American students, EL students, low-income foster youth were going to improve. Where is that money go? Where did that go? And at the end of the day, they're asking, so what happened to those schools that didn't improve? I think that if those three questions are not answered in a way that it is in a way concise and clear to parents, we will once again lose another opportunity to develop a strong partnership with families because in three or four years from now, we're gonna go, districts are gonna go out there and tell parents, hey, why don't you come back to these LCAP meetings that we're having? And if those three answers, those questions are not answered, I don't think anybody's gonna show up. And, we'll go, and we once again are gonna be in a situation where we'll look at this, those parents don't care, that's why they don't come to these meetings, you know. Uh, and, but we have failed to, to see that is because the follow through in being able to maintain that relationship with families is critical. Um, and, and so I, I would say that, you know, that, that, that critical about accountability is going to be able to measure student success, understand the student achievement at the end of the day is the key priority you wanna measure, but understand that the other seven state priorities have a link to, uh, to student achievement. Parent engagement improves student achievement. Decreasing suspensions increase student achievement. Being able to make those links and provide quality data uh, uh, on achievement and, and, um, and, and fiscal uh, transparency that would help us all understand we're on the same page. So I, I know I ran uh, a little bit longer than expected, but I really appreciate this opportunity because it is this kind of conversations to hear from county uh, districts and nonprofits that makes the LCFF a very rich process. So. I really thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Cruz. Um, you raise a lot of issues, and, and one that's been raised by several groups, advocacy groups and others, is how do we really know if we're being successful? I mean, I'm, I've heard a lot of positives about LCFF and the LCAP and how it's helping districts um, um, in terms of planning and how county officers are working with the, the local districts. Um, and everything sounds good and like it's moving in the right direction. I think everybody at least on this panel, if I asked, are we better off now than we were four years ago, would probably say yes, not just because of increased funding, but because of the direction we're going in terms of planning. Um, how are we going to know next year, the year after, a few years down the road, if in fact the, the most targeted students, the English learners and the, the low-income students, 
are, are getting better at the rate they should be under LCFF. And whoever. Well, I know through throughout our process for strategic planning, you know, you, you touched on a good point that some some uh, folks may be engaged in a one day kind of uh, planning. But um, I know that we've gone, we're, we're going into our fourth session. It's a total of five. But the data is what is driving our focus. And that light is, I mean, we're talking a searchlight is on our targeted students. And so, and that was a huge fear personally. You know, um, like I said, I've been in education for a while and um, knowing that we were shifting, and some say we were playing a nutshell game when it came to funding. Here's the way the old categoricals work, and here's what we're looking at now. It's all in one bucket. So the responsibility is the accountability piece. And when you take that on, you're looking, you're making sure that our targeted students are at the forefront of any dollar. And so we're using that data. I think it's the multiple measures step that we are, I, I, I think we're embracing. For too long, we sat, and I, I lump us all in this, we sat on the laurels of that, you know, summative test, that one test a year. But now we are opening, we're welcoming the fact that there are multiple measures because that's when we get a true picture of our students and where they're going. So I think that we're going to be able to not just have a laundry list of measures, but we're going to be able to pull out those pieces that will drive how we write that narrative of academic achievement. Thank you, yeah. Superintendent Martin, and then Superintendent Maharis. Thank you. Um, so how will we know? Let's define the we. The we at the state level, we don't know yet how the state's going to know because at the local level, we've designed these measures with our families and community beyond input process. That's why I put monthly LCAP updates because we want to go back to our community and say, here's what we said we're going to do, here's what we're doing, How's it go how is it going? So we look at the data every single month. We do reviewable data. Some data points you can only check once a year, but some you can look at on an ongoing basis. Um, my colleague here talked about the floodlight, that we talk about data is now used not as a hammer, but as a flashlight. And in a new, we're redesigning at the state and national level what accountability looks like. And during this transition, we've decided locally what measures our families, our teachers, our community believes in the most. We said, here's how we're going to spend the money, and these are the dials we expect to move. And then we check and we give ourselves feedback, and the, the spotlight is on the students where we targeted the money. We expect to see outcomes, and we've decided what outcomes we expect to see, and we report to one another, and we're in the baseline year of it. So how will we know in San Diego a year from now while we're establishing the baselines in year one, year two, year three of our LCAP, and as that improves year by year, we're going to watch the targets change and the accountability of, well, so what happens if they didn't? The beauty of the LCAP is also being able to pivot, being able to say, we thought if we invested in a program around parent engagement that we would see this outcome, and if we don't see it, we need to pivot the strategy. I think we've heard testimony in the previous panel about being sure the state does have some targets in, in the LCAPs that we can measure across districts. So that's yet to be determined, but we're going in the right direction at the local level. If, if families and parents and teachers know how kids are doing on an ongoing basis using formative assessments, then the summative that comes at end of the year state test that's a summative will be fine because the formatives will lead up to that. Thank you, Dr. Maris. Yes, I, I think that we know what to do. It's a question of the political will. It has to be a matter of integrity. Um, the data is what it is. There are measurements to determine the effectiveness of the intervention. Um, technology today has liberated us so that we can know instantaneously whether something is working or not. But do we have the courage to have these conversations with each other? superintendents with teachers and teachers with, with superintendents and principals and parents. Parents have an absolute voice and a place at the table and for a long time they have been marginalized. But for me, it gets back to data, follow the data, does it measure what it says uh, it will measure? And this is where county offices need to step up. This is our role, this is our responsibility to help our districts to serve as a support mechanism for them and to understand that the kids in our county belong to us. When I was a superintendent, I felt that my county superintendent was with me in the battle. 
And it can't just be a, pro, a, a re reactive model. It must be proactive. We must be out there way in advance of this. So the question, once again, goes back to, do we have the political will to make the change? May, Mr. Kruger? Um, I would say that this is uh, the importance of the rubrics are going to be critical to be able to determine whether we're moving forward uh, in the future. And this process of uh, being able to shape the rubrics is going to have to lead to clear indicators. Because if we let every district be able to feel that they're successful in whichever way, and there may be other indicators that they want to use for that, but at what point do we say as a state, this is what we think it is critical for everybody? Uh, so the process of the rubrics is going to be very important uh, to make sure that we um, it's not just a self-reflection tool. I mean, in a way, we're striving for a place where everybody's above average, but, you know, that can't be. Um, but we need to make sure there aren't uh, differences based on race, income, gender, et cetera. Senator Allen. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for your testimony, and thanks for all your hard work on this. Um, I've never heard such a rosy assessment of the LCAP, so I'm, I'm, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I got, honestly, I'm, um, it, it's, it's, it's encouraging. It's we encouraging. We yeah. Uh, so I, I wanted to kind of talk about a couple things and, and um, first of all, ask you, you know, I'm also aware of the fact that maybe we wouldn't have necessarily heard testimony from um, superintendents who were critical of LCAP. I mean, do, do you want to do, do for the superintendents in the in the on the panel? I'd love to hear your thoughts of whether you think that your very positive experiences are uh, reflective and your positive perspectives are reflective of your colleagues in other districts and other counties. So let me start with that question and I'll have a couple others. There's a lot of work to be done still on the LCAP and we talked about needing to align some of the state um, plans that were required to put together and the expertise at the local level to be able to actually write the plan as a guiding document. My colleague talked about it's really hard to describe what's happening from an equity lens inside a box, inside a plan that's an accountability plan that we turn in, that on the ground what's happening when you go to the schools and talk at the local levels, it's um, you, you can see even more clearly what's happening. So, you know, we're, we believe in what's behind it. We believe in the purpose and the reasoning and the methodology for it, but it's a challenging tool to use. And especially the first year, we appreciate that the state took a lot of feedback, lots of feedback about how to modify it. So let me actually follow up on that, and mm -hmm. I, I know we're going to have a perspective. My colleague has things to say too, I'm but, sure. But you know, you're a superintendent. You're proactive. You seem very engaged. Um, you already have a job offer from Orange County. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> Chairman Block might you know, not appreciate that. But, yeah, 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 that's right. <laughs> Got to remember who the chair is. Um, but you know, why did you need? What, what, what is it so special about this new state mandate, uh, with a lot of boxes to fill and a lot of paperwork to take care of, that you couldn't have done before? Uh, within your power as a superintendent? Well, that's actually at the very beginning of my testimony. What I was expressing is that our district embarked on this in 2009 when we adopted our Vision 2020 Equality School in Every Neighborhood, where we believed that the Board of Education committed to it shouldn't matter where you live in our district. And we have a very diverse district from La Jolla to City Heights to Logan Heights, that no matter where you live in San Diego, you'll have a quality education. And it's not about taking a bus across town to a school with a different API to get a better education. And our board and our community in 2009 began the process of identifying what makes a school quality. And we identified our 12 indicators, and then the, the board used that to begin to allocate resources. And we, our board began allocating district resources before LCFF, before the LCAP, with equity in mind. So the way we distributed our Title I dollars, for example, or the way so, that we- So let me, let yeah. me I, this is fantastic. But, you know, so if you found that the LCAP, sounds like you were already embarking on a great strategic planning process very much within the spirit of the LCAP. Uh, has this helped along? Has it hindered? Has it, it provided aligned. you with a whole set of new bureaucratic requirements that, yes. you know- it aligned to what we were doing because at its heart was equity and at, at its heart was local control. So the, the two founding principles of LCFF and then the LCAP are the principles that our district already believed in. There's a layer of bureaucratic requirements and mandates and things that we need to do that make that challenging because it's the work we want to focus on doing the work and the as the the amount of requirements that we have to turn in and, and document the work we understand and 
I guess I'd say we're willing to do it because we know that as you made very courageous, difficult political decisions here in Sacramento, we want to be able to respond and we want to be able to publicly share what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're doing it. And we know that you need us to prove the efficacy of it. And so I guess we understand that there will be um, requirements that go with it, but because the founding principles of this work is completely aligned to what we were already doing. Local control, our local control version of it was instead of school board deciding what to do to the schools and for the schools, our 12 quality school indicator initiative and vision 2020 was going to the schools and saying, if you want to know what works, ask the people doing the work, ask the parents, ask the teachers, ask the local schools. And our board did that to decide local board decisions around how to do um, use resources at the school district level. And then LCFF came along in the state aligned to what we already are doing. And yep, there are required documents to go with it, and I guess we understand that that's part of the process. We'd like to have influence over those documents. We'd like to um, have, if, if the LCAP could accurately show the degree to which San Diego Unified has completely invested in equity for a long time, um, Right now, you read our LCAP, and it doesn't fully tell the picture of what's happening on the ground. And that's disheartening to us, those, on the, uh, those of us on the ground doing it, our principals every day that are major equity warriors in San Diego. You look at the LCAP through a lens and through a rubric, and it's really hard to see and tease out what's really happening. And so I'd like to see better alignment between that, that LCAP should tell the story of what's actually happening, and it's not quite doing that yet, and we'd like to continue to be involved in giving input so a parent could read the LCAP and say, this is inspirational, so that a, community, a, a citizen who doesn't even have children in the school could read it and say, look at what's happening with our dollars.